Pastor Dan did the first teaching on uh, why family matters, did a great job with that. It is our prayer that through this, through these teachings, um, we can shed a little bit of light on what family really means, because I think that um, it loses a little significance. It seems like every generation, next generation, next generation, next generation, families get uh, further and further apart sometimes, and it more and more uh, separated. And society itself, by simple devolution, it redefines family on a continual basis. Every year or two years or five years or ten years, it seems to be redefined by society. And we have to be very, very careful to not let society define what family means from a biblical perspective, from any perspective at all. The sad part of this all is, is that it, if it stayed outside of the church, it would be sad enough. But what ends up happening is that it kind of begins to creep into the church. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, we have lives. We have social lives. We have public lives. We have business lives. And we're out among everybody. And if we're not careful, we begin to pick up some of those habits. And if we begin to pick up those habits, and instead of going by what the Word of God says, we begin to go by uh, other opinions. You know, they say that if a couple is together long enough, they begin to look like each other. And I apologize, Becky, to you ahead of time. <laughs> but you do see couples that, you've seen the little YouTube videos, right, of the guys that look like they're dogs? Well, this is different than that, but it's people looking like each other over a period of time. We as Christians are not immune to that. We are not immune to hanging out with certain types of individuals and begin to talk like them, begin to react like them. One of the bands that I was in with Jerry, and that is you begin after a while to have these little sayings that you put together as a team, and only the team knows what's going on, but you, you begin to pick up a little bit of this guy, and a little bit of that guy, and a little bit of the other person, and pretty soon you're a combination of all of those things. So we need to be reminded, and I think on a continual basis, of who we are as sons and daughters of the Lord. And do a self-check and see if we are still on track. Because, guys, we are sons and daughters of Jesus Christ, first and foremost. That becomes our family. He becomes the head of that family. So we cannot, we mustn't allow the tide of public opinion begin to change what God has already told us. Because a lot of times you hear people say things and they firmly believe that it's in the Bible. And it's, it's not there. You know, God helps those who help themselves. Where, where do we get that? Where do we pick that up from? Probably a well-meaning parent, right? That passed that along to the kids and it got passed on. Well, that's, that's not in here. You don't find that in scriptures. So, if we do nothing, we will transform and not transform for the best, we will transform for the worst. Our life will be in disorder. And you see a lot of people whose life is in disorder, but the sad part of it is, even in church, when you meet people, a lot of times you see that their life is in disorder. A lot of counseling that we do, when someone comes in, you realize they, one of the first things you ask them is, how's your devotional life? You know, are you getting an opportunity to be able to read the word? Are you being able to have any kind of devotional? And almost without fail, the answer to that is, well, I've been really busy, and I've really let that slip. And that's something that we cannot do. So, as you might have guessed, my title this morning is Who's On First? And my text for this morning is out of Colossians chapter 1. So, let's pray, and we'll begin. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank uh, you that it is the anchor of our soul. And that, Father, no matter where we get, no matter how far off we get, no matter how sidetracked we get, no matter how preoccupied we get, we can always come back to your word and it centers us again. It puts us back where we need to be. So, Lord, I just pray that this morning 
in this part two, who's on first, that we will know and understand that if we follow what you ask us to follow, things will make sense. And even if we've not followed that for a long time, it will begin to make sense. Things will begin to be put in order again. So no matter what condition we are in, no matter what condition our families are in, no matter what condition our marriage is in, if we can get this principle, it will all start to mend. It will all start to come back together again. And for the young couples that may be just starting out, may they get this lesson early in life so that their marriage starts with you first, that their family starts with you first. And Lord, may it get to the point to where even our day starts with you first in every single thing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, I want to start off by giving you the reason that this letter was written to the Colossian church in the first place. A lot of junk teaching had again crept in to the church. So it fits kind of of what we are living in today. A lot of stuff has crept in, and we have to be very careful. And what's really interesting, it seems to be three or four basic teachings of heresy that just put on a new hat and a new shirt and a new tie, and then it circles back around again, it comes back into the church. And it becomes a little more modern, a little more hip, and then it circles back around, and it comes into the church again. I'm going to go over just a couple of these and some subtitles in there too, but one of them is syncretism. Those of you that are writing down, it's S-Y-N-C-R-E-T-I-S-M, syncretism, and this is basically a simple definition of what it is. It is the attempt to blend and reconcile various philosophies. The attempt to blend and reconcile various philosophies. And if you talk to even a lot of Christians today, and you sit down with them and try to get a, a, a synopsis, synopsis of the reason of the hope that lies within them, in other words, the Word of God, a lot of times you will get a blend. It, it's a blend of a lot of different philosophies. In this particular ca uh, case in Colossae, it was an attempt to blend um, Eastern philosophy with Jewish legalism, and with Gnosticism. Now, if you look at the word Gnosticism, the first word is Gnosis. Gnosis, or G-N-O-S-I-G-O-N-S-T-I-C, the was the Gnostic. We'll go with that, okay? And basically what it means is to know. It's where we get our word knowledge from. But you have people who think they're in the know. There's always got to be something new, some new revelation. And in a lot of cases, what ends up happening is they think that they are spiritually superior. So here's the way it will manifest in your life. You will meet somebody, and they will say, oh, where do you go to church? And you say Calvary Chapel or whatever church you go to, and they'll go, oh, well, are you guys spirit-filled? Do you guys speak in tongues? Do you guys believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Do you guys believe in this? Do you believe in once saved, always saved? Do you believe in this? Do you believe in that? And then, of course, if you balk a little bit, they'll go, well, let me set you straight. They don't say it that way. But they'll tell you that this new path or this new thing that they have discovered. And it's still the case. It's still there, and it's still going around. You have people who will think that they are spiritually superior because they know something you don't know, as though you can't get it all from this, as though there is something missing in the Word of God, and God has visited them personally and given them some divine revelation that's not in here. There's an old saying that if it's new, it's probably not the truth, and if it's truth, it's probably not new. Because this has been around quite a while. It's been around quite a while. So anybody who comes in with some new divine revelation, now if it's, if it's a divine um, wisdom that's placed in an already revealed portion of Scripture, that's a different thing. But when somebody comes to you with something that's not in Scripture at all, that's a whole new thing. Okay, some of the heresies that fell under this was that all matter, all material, is evil. There was a group that believed that. 
So bring that, if you will, bring that all to the logical end of that thought. If all matter is evil, then a holy God could not have contact with matter. God could not have contact with material universe. You know what that does with Jesus? He's gone. Because what that means is that Jesus could not have become God in the flesh if you subscribe to this philosophy. And there was a lot that did. There was another group that preached that the only way to conquer evil matter was with rigid discipline and self-denial. That's legalism. The only way to conquer sin, if you go by this set of circumstances, it means there's a whole bunch of hoops that you've got to jump through. And if you miss any of those hoops, you're going to go to hell. And what that does too is that if I'm jumping through more hoops than you're jumping through, it makes me feel superior and I'm going to let you know about it. Right? Isn't that the whole idea of being a legalist? Is because you're jumping through the hoops and you feel like you're more spiritual than the other person. Now, here's another one. Well, actually, this one kind of falls in under that. It's called ascetism or asceticism. Or asceticism, excuse me, that's how it's pronounced. Asceticism. A-S-C-E-T-I-C-I-S-M. Now, this particular group believed that all matter, the material universe itself, was evil just by it, inherently evil all matter was evil so they came to the conclusion that it didn't matter how much you sinned that you know if everything was here was evil to start with then you can just sin all you want to and it doesn't matter huh? pun intended it, did, it doesn't matter right you can just do whatever you want now are they here are they still there are there people around there who believe that you can really sin all you want to? Because after all, Jesus died and paid for our sins, past, present, and future, and I'm saved, so therefore, it doesn't matter what I do. I can do whatever I want to do. So this is what Paul's dealing with. And it's really not much different than our world today. G. Campbell Morgan said this in 1961 in a book called The Unfolding Message of the Bible. And he said this, I have been told sometimes and have heard it said that the duty of the church is to catch the spirit of the age. Now, what does he mean by that? That means, based on what he's saying, and people were telling him, was that the church needed to get cool. That the, the church needed to, to come on into the times and uh, ad adopt the philosophies of the world, the entertainment, whatever it needed to be, in order to be culturally relevant. That's what he is saying by this. Let me read it again. I have been told sometimes and have heard it said that the duty of the church is to catch the spirit of the age. A thousand times no. The duty of the church is to correct the spirit of the age. And in proportion as a church becomes infected by the spirit of the age or the spirit of the city, she loses her power to do her work. You see, the power is not in the slideshows. The power is not in uh, the form necessarily of the worship. The power is not in the size of the building or how much you can make it seem like it's a theatrical experience. That's not where the power lies. The power lies in the Spirit of God. And the power lies in the name of Jesus. And the power lies in the Word of God. So if the church takes the Word of God out or waters it down or doesn't speak of it, then the church begins to lose all of its power. And if you take a look at whether the church is really having much of an impact on the world, that might explain why the church is not having the impact that it should have. So why is it relevant today? What does it have to do with family matters? Absolutely everything, guys. Absolutely everything. If you don't get anything out of this at all, please understand that it has absolutely everything. What you think about Jesus, how you feel about Jesus, what place he has in your life, 
has absolutely everything to do with what you are like when you walk out the doors. Not just these doors, but any doors. When you get up in the morning, the way you react to your family, the way you react to your spouse, the way you react to your children, and the way that you react to your boss. We still have syncretism. We still have that attempt to blend and reconcile various philosophies. You go to school, you go to college, I don't think you'll get out of uh, your AA degree without taking some philosophy class. And boy, I'll tell you, if school doesn't mess up your relationship with God, I don't know what will. The only thing worse than, than going to a, a secular college is sometimes going to a seminary. Because sometimes you go to a seminary, and depending upon what vein they're in, they'll destroy your faith in Jesus Christ by telling you parts of the scriptures are not true and some of them are allegorical and you can't trust this and you can't trust this one and this one didn't really write that book so by the time you're done you're going okay if it all falls apart that way where's God in it I've been taught all of my life that the word of God is true it can be trusted and now you're telling me that it can't be that's a destruction of our faith and what a sad thing that is happening in some of our colleges especially in our seminaries. There are places and times where the church doesn't even look like the church anymore. It has become very, very proficient at entertainment and anemic in the Word of God. I sat down and talked to one of our Calvary Chapel pastors several years ago because he had gone off into another tangent. He had gone off into... a well, I'll just say, he's gone off into another tangent, joined another group of churches. And uh, many, many churches now have a, a, a canned church. But what I mean by that is if you go join them and you put in a certain amount of money, they will do all of your publicity for you. They will do all of your flyers for you. They will tell you what you need, help you put together a band, help you to put together all your multimedia and everything else. And it works. It works. You can have a church and overnight there'll be five, six hundred people there. The next time there may be a thousand people. It does work. He abandoned all that and he came back to the Calvary Chapels. And I remember him talking and someone asked him, he said, well, why? Why did you do that? And he says, you know, it works. But he said, because the word wasn't sinner, we had as many people going out the back door as we had coming in the front door. And he said that every week, from Monday all the way to Sunday was a production. Everybody was putting together banners and putting together this and putting together that. The band was rehearsing to the point to where it was almost like a live TV show. And he says that was just excruciating every week to have to put everybody through that. They went back to Calvary. They lost some of those, but they ended up gaining people who wanted to hear the word of God again. But that was his own personal journey. So we have to be careful. We have to be careful that we're not part of changing the church to where it no longer looks like church. Well, again, you ask me, Pastor, what does that mean? What does that look like? Now, this is just my opinion. You don't have to buy into my opinion. I'm letting you know that this part right here is my opinion. I think we have done a tremendous disservice to a lot of our worship leaders over the last 10 years. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, they've become rock stars. They, there was a period of time there to where they were filling up arenas. They were going to arenas. And our worship people were becoming rock stars. They were playing in arenas. Now, you might say, well, what's so wrong with that? I don't think anybody is, is built to be worshipped except for Jesus Christ. It puts too much pressure on them. They've got to go out every week and, and, and put on the show. Now, if, if that's the calling that they feel God's given to them, I can't, I can't stand in the way of God's calling on someone's life. But what I can say is I feel sorry for them because what once was something that was just a beautiful little thing, Maybe just started out between them and a guitar singing praises to God like David on the backside, you know, when he was out there with the sheep. It, it becomes a, a, a big thing. And now you've got to go out and you've got thousands and thousands of people who think you're the superstar and those songs came from Jesus. 
So what I'm saying is that I feel, I feel sorry for them. And we did that. Christ, we as Christians, we did that. I don't know if you guys remember back in your secular days, but it was like you had your favorite bands, and you had to listen to your favorite bands, and then you couldn't wait for the next album to came out, come out. And when the album came out, you go, man, I love this song, you buddy. I love that song too. Or you listen on this side, you listen on that side, you listen to the B side. Which one's your... And then the next album comes out, concert comes into town. Oh, I'm getting tickets in advance. I'm going to go to that. That all went from the secular bands to... Christian man. It went to, to worship. Now, am I saying that's all wrong or that people have evil hearts? That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that I think we put people in positions that they do not belong. And as Christians, if we're not careful, we can put our spouses in a position that they are not capable of handling. We can put our friends in a position that they are not capable of handling. And even we can put ourselves in a position that we are not equipped to handle. The only one that can handle that kind of pressure is the Lord himself. So I'm going to move on. Another byproduct of this is the legalist. We still have the legalist. And I think that there's a little legalism maybe in all of us. And I think that's why so many Christians are failing today is because they have so many hoops to jump through that if they knock one of them down or they knock one of the hurdles over, they feel defeated. It's like, I can't do this. I can't be the kind of husband that I need to be. I can't be the kind of wife I need to be. I can't be the, the teenager that I need to be. I can't do these things. I'm not capable of doing these. And we go, I'm so frustrated. I'm just going to give up. Sin is a whole lot easier. I'm comfortable with sin. I have a lot of practice at sin. I spent many years at sin. I can fall into that without having to do anything. That's what legalism does to us if we do not understand the grace of God and how it works in our life. Now, is asceticism, is it still here? Of course. Remember, it's the belief that since all matter is evil, you can engage in any kind of sin to you, that you want because it doesn't matter. It's not much different today. It really isn't. There's a lot of Christians who believe that they can do anything they want with no consequence. We need to know and understand each and every action has an equal and opposite reaction. If we're going to sin, there's going to be a side effect to that. Some of them carry great consequences, even though Jesus has forgiven us. You may have done this. You may have gone to Jesus. And you said, Father, forgive me. And he goes, I have. But that doesn't mean there won't be a certain amount of consequence to deal with that. We still have people misinterpreting 1 John 1, 9, which says this, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That, for some people, means, hey, I can do whatever I want. All I got to do is go into confession and ask God to forgiveness, and I'm good. I can go back out, and I can do the same thing. And I can keep this cycle up. I can keep doing this over and over and over again. Now, I'm not trying to diminish the grace of God. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. But what I am saying is that we need to know that as Christian people, we have a certain responsibility to, to live by this. Not by what our friends say. Not by why, what the guy at the bar that's just as messed up as we are, not, you know, that he's passing along his information. Not even the people that we work with, although they might be nice folks. We can't go by their philosophy of life. We've got to go by the Lord's. We, we need to implant on our brain that sin matters. Sin matters. This, has Jesus taken, Jesus taken care of it? Yes. He has, and he's told us exactly how to apply that to be forgiven of those sins. But please don't make the misunderstanding of thinking that sin doesn't matter, because it does matter. You can sin against your wife, you can sin against your husband, you can sin against your children, you can sin against your family, and there are always certain repercussions with that. Here's the next one. Do the Gnostics still exist? Are there still people around there that's got... Always trying to tell you that there's something more, that they're smarter than you, that they're better than you, that they discovered some secret about God that you don't know and they're willing to fill you in to make you feel like where you go is not good enough. 
Yes, they're still there and we still have them. They are the spiritual elite. Now, please understand, I did not say the spirit-filled. I said the spiritual elite. All right, look at verses 1 and 2. Actually, we're going to go probably to about verse 7. Paul, in a Colossians. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to the Lord for you. And a Father, uh, to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your, here it is, I underline this in mind, faith in Jesus Christ and of your love for all the saints because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has to all in the world and is bringing forth fruit. As it is also among you since that day that you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. As you also learned from Epaphras, our dear brother and our fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ in our behalf, on our behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. So I'm just going to, the part I really want to get to is coming up, but I wanted to be able to put this there so there's continuity. But Paul breaks almost into praise about this church. Did you notice that? He's so thrilled with the way they're living their life. And he commends them on their faith in Jesus Christ. And notice what their faith in Jesus Christ had done. It had caused them to love one another. One of the earmarks of our Christian faith. If we are always cranky, we're always bitter, we're always angry, we have to wonder. We have to wonder. What's our source? What's our source of strength? And what's our source of power? Because faith in Jesus Christ gives us hope. And if it gives us hope, it also puts a smile on our face. Okay, let's move on to verse 9. He says, For this reason, we also, since the day that we heard it, we do not cease to pray for you and to ask you may be filled. Now, these, I, I, if you write in your Bibles, please write these words down because they're important. That you would be filled with the knowledge, okay? Knowledge is the first one I want you to underline. With the knowledge of his will in all, the next one is wisdom. And spiritual understanding, number three, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, bringing fruitful in, being fruitful in every good work. And here's the next one, increasing in the knowledge of God. Increasing in the knowledge of God. Now, I want to stop there for just a moment. And I want to be careful how I say this. Ultimately, you cannot depend on your pastor to make you increase in the knowledge of God. I hope that you can, but I've met a lot of people who have been at a church for eight years, ten years. I remember it was about eight years into my walk before I really understood that growing in the knowledge of God was my responsibility. And sometimes you might go to a church where you don't hear the word much. You might hear a lot of topical messages. And, you know, it's not uncommon, again, kind of the spirit of the age, that you, you might get a kickoff scripture. You know, you might get one scripture, and then they kick off into something else, and sometimes don't even come back to the word of God. So increasing in the knowledge of the Lord. Hopefully what pastor is doing, whichever church you go to, is a supplement to what you're doing. It's just adding to your knowledge of the Lord. But if you do not get it necessarily there, let's say you're involved. You're very, very involved. Maybe you're in the back when the teaching is going on. You have to be fed. We have to learn that that's our responsibility. Now, let's continue on with verse 11. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. Giving thanks to the Father who has, here's another word I want you to underline, or two of them, qualified us, who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has, here's another one I want you to get, delivered us 
from the power of the darkness. And here's the last one I want you to get in this section. And that is, he has conveyed us into the kingdom of his love. You know what a conveyor belt is, right? It moves you from one thing to the next. You've all been to the airport and lost your luggage, or at least waiting on your luggage for an hour and a half. It comes out of the luggage bin, and it gets conveyed all the way back around. If you can't get to it the first time, you have to wait another few minutes, and it comes back around again. He has conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. So Paul tells the the Colossians that he's been praying for them, and it's no accident that he uses these words, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Remember, one of the problems plaguing this church was Gnosticism, the worship of knowledge. The worship of knowledge. The worship of wisdom, the worship of understanding. That was one of the things that was plaguing the church. Paul wanted them to have wisdom. Now, this might not be shocking revelation to you, but wisdom is the correct use of knowledge. Knowledge in and of itself doesn't do you much good. You get a flat tire. You know what needs to be done to change that tire. But you can't do it. You have the knowledge of what needs to be done. So you call somebody to fix it. Maybe your spouse. Beck's real good at changing a tire. I'm just kidding, of course. But you call somebody to fix it. And you can stand there and tell them what they're doing wrong and what they're doing right because you have the knowledge of what's supposed to be done. But you don't have the wisdom to be able to accomplish it. So, again, let me say this again. Wisdom is the correct use of knowledge. Paul wants them to have the correct use of knowledge. You and I cannot have the correct use of knowledge without God. Not this kind of wisdom that he's talking about. Not this kind of knowledge. It must come from the Lord. Because knowledge in and of itself can be very base, it can be very prideful, and it can be very carnal. Now, I'm not against education, I'm not against knowledge, and I'm not against doctorate degrees, but you've got to have the wisdom that goes along with that. If I go in for surgery, I want my doctor to have the wisdom, not just the knowledge. I don't want him to stand there, well, I know exactly how this procedure is supposed to go, but I've never done one. I don't know what to do. You guys seen that commercial on TV where they come in, right? The doctor's just lost his license, and he just says, well, I just got it back. We're going to be okay. I don't want you to be okay. I want you to be absolutely 100% sure this is going to be great, right? Paul's telling him, we want you to have that, that understanding. We want you to have that wisdom. Okay, increasing in the knowledge of the Lord. So let me ask this. Do we know, this, do we know more today about God than we knew yesterday? Do we know more about the Lord this week than we knew last week? Do we know more about God in the last year than we knew last year? And you know the sad part of it is some of us would honestly have to say, no, I don't. And I have to say this, we have to pick up that cross. We have to know and understand that that maturity needs to come from God to us directly. So we need to have a certain amount of devotional life. Now, I, please, I don't want you right now to jump on the guilt wagon because I don't know a Christian alive who doesn't wish they had more devotion. So it's easy for Satan to come in and try to mess with you there. Let's take it this way. Let's, let's bathe it in God's mercy and God's grace. He's not going to condemn you, but we're going to lose out. We're going to lose out. We're going to miss so much of what God wants in our life. So, remember, he said, so that you'll walk in a manner. This is the reason. Why do we do that? What's the purpose? 
so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. So please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthening in all power according to the glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and peace and joyous. Now, and enjoy. I want all of those. I want those for me. I want those for my marriage and I want that in my family. I want that in the work that I do. I want to wake up in the morning saying, you know what, this is the day that God's made. Let me rejoice and be glad in it. That doesn't mean that we don't go through sicknesses and illnesses and we go home to be with God eventually. It doesn't mean that we're immune to everything, but what it does mean is that I can wake up in the morning and be glad that I'm alive. I can have a purpose. I can have meaning in my life. So, Look at these words, qualified. He's qualified you. That word qualified means to equip with adequate power. You say, but I can't do it. No, that's not what this says. Because a lot of times we go, well, I just just can't do that. Well, that's not true. He qualified us. He's equipped us with the adequate power. To think that we can't do it is to not believe this. We can. Will you get perfection? No, you won't. But I can be successful at my marriage. I can be successful as a dad, even if I had a lousy example as a dad. I can be successful as a Christian when I learn to trust in the mercy and the love and the grace of a Savior that loves me. I can do this. I've been qualified. He's equipped us with the adequate power The next one is delivered. The word delivered means to be rescued. He has rescued you and I from the domain of darkness. You and I don't have to live that way anymore. We don't have to go to the bars. We don't have to do the pornography. We don't have to swear at our spouse. We don't have to scream and yell at our kids or abuse our kids. We don't have to do any of that. You know, people say, well, that's the way I was taught. Well, who cares? We were taught a lot of things that were not right. We had a lot of bad examples in our life, but he's qualified. He's equipped us to be able to say, you know what? I'm going to break the chain. If there's a bunch of alcoholics in my family, I'm not going to become an alcoholic by God's grace and God's mercy. If there's a lot of drugs in my family, I'm, I'm, not, I'm going to be the one that doesn't do it by God's grace and by God's mercy. I can do this in Jesus Christ. I can be the man that he wants me to be. And it says he's conveyed or transferred. Means to transpose or translate or to remove from one place to another. God has taken us out of that pit. We're not the same people we used to be. We are new creatures in Christ. All we've got to do is accept that. Jesus transferred us. And the last one, he says, he redeemed us. That means to liberate by paying a ransom. Oh, boy, I love this. We were kidnapped. We were held for ransom. And it was billions and billions and billions of dollars and our family was on welfare. There was no way. We would never get out of that place. Could never get out of that place. Eventually, maybe even lose our life. And Jesus stepped up and said, I don't care what it costs. I'll pay it. And he redeemed every single one of us. He liberated us from sin and death by paying that ransom with his own blood. With his own life. Now guys, I know that we're in church and I know I'm a pastor and I know you're hearing me say these things and it's just, it's just church, right? I I wish I could say it in technicolor. I wish I could say it and it would just come out in color. But God has done so much for us. And he loves you so much. Okay, now, this is the part I really want to get to because you'll find out who's on first. Look at verse 15. Verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God. Who is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is God wrapped in flesh. Jesus is God wrapped in flesh. 
He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Here it is, guys. For by him all things were created. All things were created. Everything that you and I enjoy, even the air, the oxygen, it's a gift. It's a gift. Have you ever bought things for your kids? And it's like, let's say it's not even a, a, a present. Let's say it's a, more of a, of a trip. You take them to Disneyland, right? Or you take them on a trip. And five minutes later, they're complaining because they didn't get a, something else. Right? Everything that we have is a gift, and yet we're sometimes like that little child. It's like, oh, no, I can't, I didn't get any cotton candy, but I saved your life. Yeah, but I didn't get any cotton candy. <laughs> but I saved your life. I've transferred you. I've conveyed you from hell to heaven, and I've given you eternal life. Yeah, but I didn't get any cotton candy. <laughs> it's like if we could just understand the bounty, the beauty, the wonder of what God has done for us created all things visible and invisible verse 16 by him all things were created the things that are in heaven the things that are on uh, the earth visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers all things were created through him and by him look at verse 17 and he is before all things now underline that put color by it put stars by it let me ask you this is he all things to you is he before all things in our lives? I mean all things. Is he before your marriage even? Because your marriage will not be what it's supposed to be if he's not. Is he before your kids? Because you won't know how to raise them if he's not. Is he before your entire marriage and family? Is he before your work? Is he before your pride and our egos and everything else? Is he before all things? All things. And it says, and in him all things consist. Without him, there's nothing. Without him, there's nothing. If all things were created in him and through him and by him, if he's not there, if he doesn't exist, it's nothing. There's nothing. And guys, that translates into our lives. If he's not first in our life, if he's not all things to us as individuals, then there's nothing. Nothing's going to make us happy. Nothing's going to satisfy us. Nothing is going to give us meaning in life. So he must be before all things. And in him, all things must exist. He is the head of the body, the church, which we'll be talking about at another time, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and in all things that he may have preeminence. Does he have preeminence in my life? Now again, I wish I could speak this in color. Pastor, what does that mean? It means exactly what you think it means. I need to be a fanatic about Jesus Christ. You go to a football game, you see all kinds of fanatics, don't you? You go to a baseball game, you go to whatever sport, you go to a concert, you see all kinds of fanatics, the ones that won't sit down in the front rows. The ones that are being, I don't know if they even do that anymore, passing each other along down the... Those are the fanatics. We look at them and go, they're a fan. That's awesome. But how about the Christian? When we see a Christian that's a fanatic about Jesus, what do we say about him? Do we say, I want that. I want it balanced in wisdom and grace and mercy but I want to be a fanatic for Jesus. Not an afterthought. Not a thought on Sunday only. Maybe a thought sometimes on, on midweek or maybe just sometimes on a holiday. That's, guys, if I can say it at all, I don't want to be condemning, but that's not it. That's not the answer. Now, you might be saying, well, I don't have to go to church to still be a fanatic about Jesus. You're absolutely right. Because being a fanatic about Jesus is not just Wednesday and it's not just Sunday. 
It's 24-7. 24-7 that Jesus is on your mind. Preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. Now, all the fullness should dwell. Well, I need Jesus in something else. No, you don't. Well, I, you know, that, that's all fine. Jesus is fine. The Bible's all fine. Church is all fine. But that doesn't take care of every. It does take care of everything else. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if you put God first, God will guide everything else. Let's say you had $1,000 to invest. And you could go get one of these guys on the streets who's talking to himself. And you can give him your $1,000 and say, I want you to invest this $1,000. Or you can go to someone who is a master planner, a master financial planner, and say, uh, would you invest this? And the odds are pretty good that you're going to get more back than that 1000 because he knows what he's doing. Which one would you choose? Do you know how many Christians, without realizing what they're doing, is picking the guy on the street? Why do we do that? That makes no sense. If you want to have someone who knows what they're doing, put it in God's hands. And that's not just money. That's everything. Absolutely everything. Because he's a master of it all. He knows how to do all of it better than anybody we could possibly pick. So what little we have is better off in the hands of Jesus. Faith, trust, Change, <laughs> marriage, family. It's all better off in the hands of Jesus. Okay, then he says in verse 20, And by him to reconcile all things to himself. In other words, reconciling the world to God. By him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross, and you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through his death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight if indeed you continue in the faith grounded and steadfast and you're not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard which was preached to every creature under heaven of which I Paul became a minister now that does not mean that if you've given your life to Jesus Christ and you have a bad day that you're going to hell this means people who never accept Jesus Christ in the first place that, that last section He's saying that if you miss Jesus, you've missed it all. If you want hope, it exists in Jesus Christ. Jehovah wrapped in the flesh. That is Jesus Christ. All things in him, through him, by him. Okay, I'm about to close here. Ephesians 6, 12, it says, For we do not wrestle against what? flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. The rabbis would use this same phrase to describe the different orders of fallen angels. But what it's saying here is Jesus is head over all things. He is the sum total of all divine power and attributes of the living God. He is above it. Yes, there's demons out there. Yes, there's evil out there. And it will try its best to get a hold of us. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful who you associate with. Be careful who you hang out with. Because if you're not careful, it will drag you down. It will mess up your walk. But God has balanced the books through Jesus Christ. Yeah, I'm going to stop there. Folks have been trying to blend weird philosophies for a long time. And you know what? I don't think that's ever going to stop. But this is the point I want to make. Who's on first? Got to get that right. Make sure that Jesus is on first. <laughs>